the obvious flip side, real implications of this idea that images can heal or, or make sick, you'd have some kind of theory of propaganda or social control. And uh, the great images of the 20th century have probably been largely damaging ideas like uh, the German idea of the master race or the Soviet ideal of Soviet man or even the American ideal of the Ward Cleaver nuclear family. But I'm not sure, is that what you mean by... I mean, there are all kinds of ways to talk about the way uh, the image is... In, in the, the image and images are impacting on, uh, on the mass psyche, like uh, you know, just things which occur off the top of my head. The fact that at a certain level now everyone has seen all these images from the Hubble Space Telescope that show that the universe is very corpuscular very organic. It's more like what you see in a tide pool or on a dissecting table than what it used to be, which were bright points of light against darkness. So, in a sense, the images of science shift the parameters of the popular imagination. Uh, a painter like Alex Gray, you know his work, creates a permission to image the human body uh, simultaneously as a biological system, an energy system, a system of Kabbalistic and mathematical energies. Uh, well, science in the 20th century, I mean, and before to some degree, but certainly in the 20th century, has permitted all kinds of imaginary worlds to be entertained in the popular imagination because most of the explanations of science involve things you can't see, hear, feel, taste, or touch. In other words, electrons, photons, electromagnetic fields, uh, gradients of concentration, a whole conceptual vocabulary, none of which is experiential. and. Uh, our minds are permitted and in fact can't avoid shifting level and having all kinds of information on one level available on another level, like the popularity of quantum physical metaphors to explain large-scale events in daily life, synchronicity and telepathy and stuff like that. And I, there are other sources for the image, but, you know, every time I go to New York, I was just there before I came here, I, I go to the Met and to MoMA and see whatever's showing. And modernism, which used to be this, like, virtual reality that I walked around in all the time, there was nothing but modernism, is now something I visit in a museum. I mean, it's confined inside these buildings to some degree. It's on a pedestal. And I feel, it's, it feels good to me that modernism is over. And what it means to me is that the value of the image has, or, I don't know, value, maybe medium, the medium in which the image is most at home has changed from material, paint, wood, glass, steel, plastic, acrylic, to light. It's a huge watershed, and it's a, maybe the biggest watershed in the entire career of the image, because since Lascaux forward, it's always been about applying pigment to surfaces, it's always been about material, and now suddenly it's, uh, it's about something else, and then of course, you know, we could talk about things like the artist's relationship to the public through the new, how the new tools that empower the new art to be created also empower it to be communicated in ways that uh, nobody could ever imagine before. Decommodifying it at the same time that it removes the middleman. Uh, so you get the collapse of, of an academy 
well, the academy collapsed a hundred years ago, you get the collapse of any kind of official cultural canon at all. What you have then is like a, a Darwinian environment of, uh, of competing styles and images, which it seems to me that's what art has been more and more. You know, there hasn't been a coherent school of any philosophical depth in art since the 70s, 60s. Is that the kind of thing you're thinking about? What are the, some of the new tools you think, other than a fine page or can? Well, um, all software, Photoshop, obviously, but then modeling. I mean, the thing proceeds in stages. There's first the manipulation of the painterly image, essentially an electronic canvas that allows you to do all kinds of things with great facility. Then the next level is modeling to three-dimensionally build objects that can be viewed from any point of view. And then the animation and texture mapping of these things, the placing them into environments, the setting up of tracking paths and all this, which sounds very technical, but the rate of collapse of this toward sheer intuition, so that essentially the tools that allow you to model and animate become almost lead pencil simple, is, is happening. And, you know, everything electronic is trying to add dimensionality to itself. So the computer that was text-based tends to want to speak. The image that was two-dimensional wants to be three-dimensional. The three-dimensional image wants to move. And, uh, you know, part of acquiring the full initiation of the culture at this point is learning how to do these things. Because what, what it means is you then have tools to communicate your most important thoughts the thoughts, the ideas that you're willing to take time enough to model and, and create are conveyed with real force and power. And right now, of course, it's very clunky, but I think what it means is that the very enterprise of communication among human beings is, is transforming in some way. And we're, it's, We've been at this for a while. The first telegraph lines were strung around 1819. The telephone became a common object of the upper class around 1900. But the, the rate of acceleration and the dimensionality and definition and fidelity of these processes all has increased exponentially. So really the task of communication Instead of saying, well, you learn to speak, you acquire 90% of your language skills by age five, we're just going to have to say you acquire 90% of your language skills by age 30. And by then, you know, you can model, animate, uh, code. I mean, human-machine interfacing uh, as a prerequisite to the creation of art has been going on for a long time. It's just going to be, affect more and more people. Like you know how the creation of a movie is such a massive thing in terms of manpower, capital, and technology before you ever get to the story, the actors, and the art of it. Essentially everybody is going to be the, become their own director. So the, to the degree the producer-director was a cultural ideal, we may all approach it. Well, I'm pretty optimistic about all that because I'm sort of influenced by McLuhan and the school of communication theory that he came out of. And his notion was that these technologies based on the phonetic alphabet, specifically and most importantly printing, had really done a job on our psychology and the whole theory of social relations and everything else. And he felt that the electronic media, all of them, radio, television, telephone, and on into the computer and the internet, were re-tribalizing 
elements and that we were actually going to move back into a much less linearly defined and positivist worldview than the historical worldview that had created these technologies and it seems like this is happening you know the rise of the new age the fragmentation of epistemology the cultification and commodification of religion all of these are uh, cultural effects that McLuhan predicted uh, in the 50s and early 60s in books like the Gutenberg Galaxy and uh, an understanding media ideally see there's a kind of a millenarian cast to all this because the idea is that somehow advanced technology leads back to a primitive edenic psychology he called it sensory ratio among the senses and uh, it would be nice to believe that i believe it i mean i think it's true what it will actually look like and how edenic and how neo primitive it will be but for sure a culture based on print is really inhabiting some castle in the sky of abstraction and uh, uh, you know the phonetic alphabet in the first place signifies sounds not signs so you have one level of of alienation and distancing from the object of your intent right there and then you uh you print you you uh, write it so now you have a sign for a sound for a, and then you print it so that it becomes uniform and this was the point that McLuhan made that a lot of people couldn't immediately grok was that there was a profound difference between manuscript culture and printed culture because the uniformity of print permitted ways of thinking that manuscript made impossible ideas like the democratic citizen the interchangeability of parts in an industrial production line these are all ideas that you couldn't even conceive of without the example of print as a historical precedence so you know my fantasy about all this media and communication stuff is that eventually the human imagination and the world of three dimensional physics will seamlessly merge in a dimension where human beings are uh, each and all some kind of god and the imagination and physics can flow together and the art that is in, in us intrinsically that we encounter so dramatically in the psychedelic experience can actually flow into manifestation and i don't know whether you know this happens in circuitry or 3d or so i mean it's, there are many many dimensions opening ahead of us where our humanness can exfoliate in ways that it can't do in 3d uh, but this you know i wrote a book called the archaic revival which was all about this let down from the abstraction of print created history into this post historical neo archaic electronically based more magical more shamanic more uh, gestalt kind of historical 